listening to New Bern Live, New Bern's hottest local broadcast from the Charles Tyndall Studio in the heart of downtown New Bern. Find it online at newburnlive.org, live on YouTube or podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud, or live on 103.9 FM. Having the conversations that need to be had. Join in. This is New Bern Live, powered by Toyota of New Bern. Morning, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. The mics are hot, and they shouldn't be. And that audio was down way too low. I don't was think anybody it? I heard, heard it that intro. super loud. I think it's because you have control turned all the way up. Uh-huh. And with control turned all the way up, everything sounds louder to you than it actually is. Okay. That's so how about now? Uh, I mean, you're adjusting your volume, not mine. Okay. Gotcha. So, <laughs> there you go. So I, need now, to, I need to learn things. So you, with you adjusting your volume and not mine. Sound engineer. See, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're just in your sound, uh-huh. not mine. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you missed the first hour, we talked about all the boring stuff that has to do with privacy. It's dead. Don't care about it. Don't worry about it. You're not going to get anything back from the internet. If you have a smartphone, you are going to be tracked and located. You and are watched being everywhere watched. You go. So over the course of the last week, there's been some imagery that was placed in the County Compass newspaper about a noose. Now, at the time of this broadcast, I have reached out to the County Compass to see if we could get a conversation going with the, everybody over there, and have yet to hear back. That's that's due diligence, Charles. We, I, did, our, we look, did ours. I had to do it. I uh-huh. had to make sure that I reached out to him. And don't get me wrong, I like Jeff. Mm-hmm. Right, Jeff and I have worked together on a couple of little projects out there. We've been in the place where news is happening together, and we have done things together. So, I honestly don't think this is what people are making it out to be from his perspective. But... We're going to find out, and I hope to get the other half of this. And the Sun Journal put out an article yesterday by Mr. Bill Hand, who was talking just about this imagery, and it gave me the opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. Get two birds stoned at once, dude. (laughs) To get two birds stoned at once. (laughs) To talk about this article, but then I remembered, Bill, you've got a play coming, right? Yes, I do. What is this play about, man? Because you've made the front page of everything. Everybody's (laughs) talking about it. It's it's everywhere. I'm so glad I'm not having to provide musical accompaniment to the discussion (laughs) of a noose being published. (laughs) I appreciate it. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. (laughs) Hang down your head and cry. I'm sure you get some really good music there. Um, Yeah, We've got a play coming up. In, in in January, we were performing a play, and it's called Honor the Musical. Mm-hmm. And Honor is about, the theme is the whole concept of honor. Mm-hmm. But the story that it Parker, tells turn the music through, down. Yeah, yeah but the story that it presents it through is a historical event here in, in New Bern that most people have heard of, and it's a Stanley Spate duel that mm-hmm. happened in 1802. And uh, that was a case where two politicians were really angry at each other. One had slammed the other one in public, and the other guy didn't like it. And they started arguing and fighting back and forth. They made amends, then they broke their amends. And next thing you know, they're standing out there near the old academy building or uh, the St. John's Masonic building, plugging away at each other until uh, Mr. Spate finally took a shot and died. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that, that's in a nutshell what it's about. And uh, we also carry a strong subplot within the play. And it is about Sarah Rice. Now, Sarah Rice was a slave of Richard Dobbs Spate uh-huh. and was a favorite slave. She would eventually gain her freedom. But uh, throughout this play, it follows her chase for freedom. But she also had a son named John Rice, who mm-hmm. would eventually change to John Green. And John Rice's father was John Stanley, mm-hmm. the sworn enemy of Richard Dobbs Spate. Though we don't think Dobbs Spate, we don't have any evidence that Spate knew that. And so you Could see this a lot of Could this be what the duel was over? No, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, it, it was a temper tantrum. The duel was basically ah. over a temper tantrum. When you come right down to it, it was a whole concept of you have offended my honor. And uh, and then Spade That's in it. return. You've offended yeah. my honor. I challenge you to yeah. a duel, yeah. son. Yeah, for modern and, and, people, it's just like unfriend, unfollow, <laughs> yeah, block, uh, and you're done, in, right? right? And nobody gets hurt. And but that was, the, I mean, yeah. I, I kind of prefer that today over, yeah, over and, back then. You know, like, I, I don't like too. it now. Me I'm just going to ignore you on social media yeah, versus back then I'm going to shoot you. Too. It is so ludicrous today, <laughs> and that's one reason I wanted to treat it in the full length of the play. I wrote the play, and in that way to present why would this affect these guys this way? Mm-hmm. And that's what it presents, is the mindset of the people and why this man was willing to go out and get himself killed, uh, abandon his wife, his children, possibly even destitute and everything else, mm-hmm. all over the concept of my honor has been offended. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also have the other added subplot. We do treat Barbara Jack or John Carruthers Stanley, mm-hmm. 
and he was the half brother of John Stanley. He was mm-hmm. born a slave, mm-hmm. and got his freedom, and yet. B- by the 1800s, early 1800s, he was the largest slave owner himself in the entire county. Mm-hmm. So it's it's all a very interesting story, and uh, decided to present it as a musical. And I've never even I've never directed a musical in my life, but I immediately knew the perfect man to write the music for me, and that was Mr. <laughs> Simon Spaulding. Yeah, that's how Simon got involved with all of this. <laughs> so Simon, how did you get involved with this? He just Bill just called you up one day and said, "I think you can do it. Do it." Well, it wasn't completely out of that. Uh, out of a blue sky because Bill and I worked together at Tryon Palace when we when we worked there um, and uh, in fact he and I had had conversations I remember when I was on staff there I had a big uh, aha moment about the Stanley Spate duel which I think I shared shared with Bill mm-hmm. that s- the Stanleys were all Federalists and uh, and that Spate was more or less a Jeffersonian mm-hmm. and a lot of the duels fought at that time were between people of those two opposite political camps. The uh, the Adams-Jefferson presidential election was the first really controversial election in American history, and it really polarized people mm-hmm. in, in the United States, you know, where Washington had been the commander-in-chief of the army, you know, everyone, he was a big hero, so he was a slam dunk for the first president and the second president. John Adams was kind of his anointed, appointed successor, mm-hmm. so everyone voted for him. But then Jefferson comes along and challenges a lot of what Adams had done, the Alien and Sedition Acts, the creation of a navy, uh, all kinds of, uh, the, the, the centralization of more authority in the federal government, talking about duels of that era, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Most people even outside New Bern are well aware of that duel, and Aaron Burr was more or less a Jeffersonian. Uh, Hamilton was very much a Federalist, was in, str- you know, in favor of a strong federal government, federal bank, and all, all of that. So a lot of famous, there were a lot of duels fought in that era, and a lot of them, when you look at what the political affiliations were of the duelists, you find, oh yeah, they're on the opposite side of that, mm-hmm. of that issue, uh, which of course speaks to us a lot today. <laughs> well, I mean, I would I would find it very interesting to be like, we have two separate issues right now. That, I think that's how we should go back to solving problems, honestly. I think we went back to solving problems that way with a duel, with pistols, we're on opposite edges, you know? Mm-hmm. Maybe not pistols. Maybe not pistols. You'd have to you'd have to fight with bare hands, <laughs> yeah. right? And we well, would have to play well, ooh, yeah. yeah, we, we, we I, would I'm have to sure play we would have to play the music from Star Trek, the original series, with Kirk and Spark. Absolutely. Spock absolutely. Dead, right? absolutely. <laughs> Bill, if you could duel exactly. anybody, who would it be? Me. You would I'm, duel yourself? There are times I certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> because, because both Bill and I portrayed people from the 1770s and the 1830s. Uh, I had to think about this where I stood on dueling, and I had a character who was a, a sailor from the 1830s mm-hmm. who was kind of a fun-loving, practical guy. Mm-hmm. And so when I was talking about the duels, several members of the Stanley family fought duels uh, in different places and obviously with different people. And... Um, and so my in character, as, as a person from the 1830s, I said, well, I am never going to challenge anyone to a duel, mm-hmm. ever. And if someone challenges me to a duel, as the challenged party, I have the choice of weapons. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm portraying a sailor. So I said, my choice of weapons is pails of pig manure at two, <laughs> at two paces. And I, have, and I have really good foul weather clothing. That's horrible. <laughs> That's horrible. But a high-toned gentleman is probably not going to have the right clothes to bring to this, this, this epic duel. And it, we it, you know, got everybody laughing whenever I, I, I tell that to visitors. Nice. I, I I mean, I, would, I wouldn't want to duel you. I would tap out. I would, like, clothing or not, I'd be like, I'm done. I'm not even playing this game. We're not even going to go there. A friend of mine who's a living history uh, history specialist in California uh, said that when we had that conversation, I said, this is my choice of weapons. He said, note to self, self never challenge Simon Spaulding to a duel. <laughs> so so when when does this play start? When is the, when is the play actually coming out? The performance will be the last, uh, the last full weekend of January, mm-hmm. which I forget what days those are, and then the first – the 31st of January and 1st and 2nd of February. So we're six months out. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're Whoa. Well, and, I'm, st- I'm um, still writing the music. Oh, wow. <laughs> you have, you have, have you, what, what part have you written so far? 
uh, I've written about two thirds of the original songs, and I've selected all of the scene change music. No, so yeah. I'm I'm about seventy percent done. Nice. Yeah, we we have a yeah. mixture of we there are three traditional tunes we use, and there's a campaign song called Jefferson and Liberty, which Simon can talk to you if you've got five hours for. <laughs> and uh, but I can also play it then, for about thirty yes. seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing theme throughout, but then there's also probably what about seventy percent, sixty percent of the music is original. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, good. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, percentages are. I guess yeah. I'm not sure that nobody is, but uh, there is a lot of original music for which Bill is the is the lyricist. And you sing too, one. Bill? Do I sing? Yeah. <laughs> Well, depends on whether I'm in an empty building or not. <laughs> <laughs> empty building, shower, <laughs> car. Yeah, yeah. we're going to have to listen in on the shower <laughs> and the hand, the hand household. Honestly, yeah, well, you don't have to be a great singer to be a great lyricist. Because uh -huh. I can say Bill is a great lyricist. Right, thank you. I, when he first showed me the script, and I looked at it, and it's just like, you know, this is like, it all has meter. There's not all kinds of crazy anapest going on. Mm -hmm. Or some friends of mine have said, you know, hey, I, you know, I've written some song lyrics. I want you to set to music. I look, you know, and it's a great string of phrases, but, you know, it just. It doesn't would, flow. Right. I would have to create a musical phrase mm -hmm. and then figure out a way to sing those phrases over it. Bill's lyrics just, you know, that the meter is just, is just there. Perfect. Yeah. I find myself reading it aloud and I'm already setting it. In musical musical rhythm, and that is that has helped me a lot in my job. That that his libretto, to use the operatic term, uh, is so music friendly. Nice, yeah. So Parker and I have been working on a jingle for Rolling the Home Sales Team. We might have to oh. come and pick your brain on that. <laughs> Rolling the Home Sales Team. Oh. <laughs> Rolling in the Home Sales Team. <laughs> I, I, I've written jingles for various places I worked. None of them have used them. <laughs> All your musical needs under one roof, and I've got it in like three part harmony. Who is Fuller's, that? Oh. Fuller's Music House. Oh. Fuller's Music, the oldest place in town. Get your instruments, get them so, so, now. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we got uh, so, Simon, I know David you, Rhodes. Are you listening? You've got a class to get to right after this, right? Uh, I'm going to teach. Yeah, I'm going to be teaching some fiddle lessons in uh, just a matter of minutes. Oh, right on, right yeah. on. So, what does yeah. you need to be a begin? Like, like, are you teaching beginner fiddlers? Go yeah, see I teach Wick beginners. Get I, teach, picks. I teach young students. I teach. Uh, Older people, mostly retired people. Uh, interestingly enough, the two I, I teach, I'll teach pretty much any any instrument with strings, since I'll play all, more or less any instrument with strings. But it's funny, the two that I get the most call for are at the opposite spectrums of ease of picking up, the fiddle or violin, same instrument, or and ukulele. And you know, ukulele is so no, no, easy. Just mute it. To just uh, to just pick up. Um, it's uh, you know easy on the fingers, nylon strings, low tension, strum chords, sing, really fun. Violin or fiddle, and whichever style of music you play, there's some very narrow parameters you have to work within to get a good sound out of it. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So I, uh, the reason I wanted to ask, the reason I was bringing it all in, I mean, one, I want to, I've never, I... I grew up at one point, I woke up in the middle of the night, I don't know what it was, I had a call to play the violin. Oh. And I was like, I want to try this, I want to do this. So <laughs> I woke up before Christmas and told my parents, I want a violin. So and of sure. course, they got their little eight-year-old son a violin. Good I spent 20 minutes trying to figure out how to play it, and I don't think I ever picked it up again. You, you know Niccolo Paganini. Uh, who? <laughs> Niccolo Paganini. Well, he's, <laughs> he's, he's a little past his prime now. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. That red violin's still around, though. Uh, Does yeah, it mean if you just but, paint, but you paint it what? red, you get it? You know, hey, you're a musician. You know, it's not the axe. It's the player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of an axe. Yeah. You, gotta, you, gotta have, you can be better with a good axe if you're a good player. You can be, yeah. But if you are a good player, yeah. I caught that if you can fake, If you can fake it, you can make it look good, too. Well, anyone can can look great do it playing air guitar. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am a I am a hero at the game Guitar Hero. Right. I win. So if I can play Guitar Hero, I can clearly play any instrument, right? Is is that the way it works, Parker? If you nice. give somebody a great guitar, if the instrument is as good as it could possibly be, then the only thing that you're going to hear is the person's level of skill, the person's mm -hmm. talent. But if it's unless, a bad unless, instrument, unless, then unless you're having to overcome working with the bad instrument. Unless yeah. you're Millie Vanilli. <laughs> well, in which case you have some help. <laughs> Millie Vanilli's instrument was this. They were the this. face, they, and they did a good job at that. Yeah, well, uh, so band in a box, right? <laughs> girl, you know it's true. Yeah. So, Simon, I don't know whether you want to get in on this conversation, and I wanted to give you guys both a chance to talk about this play because this is freaking amazing. Like to see yeah. local people come together and create something from scratch that is yeah. so ingrained in this area, and just to yeah. have people put it out there. 
is absolutely amazing. And I've watched Bill run around doing a bunch of stuff in the last oh, couple sure. of years that I've been here. And I didn't know that you wrote plays, you did all this other uh-huh. stuff. And when people started talking about it, like Randy came to me and he was like, have you heard about what Bill Hand is doing? I was like, wait, <laughs> what? Dude, what did he do? <laughs> Everybody's he talking about what? it. So it's, so it's, uh-huh. he got who to write the music? Exactly. So it's, Jan- so it's January. January, and I've had a calendar, I tell you exactly, the last full week from Thursday to Sunday, Uh and then also the 31st of January, the 1st and 2nd of February. Now, Uh also, we are having tryouts this week. Oh, nice. So you need people to come... Yeah, and the tryouts, and it's parts for Caucasians, African Americans, we've got a couple of kids' roles in it. Boys, we need a a nine-year-old African American boy. Ooh. And I know one. An, and about a six or seven year old. Uh, <laughs> I have one. I can yeah. Oh, there you go. And he doesn't have Bring to sing. <laughs> so if he can act and, and be kind of snotty on stage, he's good. Oh, so, Bill, you're going to close on Groundhog's yeah. Day? Yes, we are. Unless and you any, get stuck in the loop. Over and Unless over you get stuck in the loop. Over, over and over, over, over again. Again. Anybody who brings a live groundhog gets 20% off. <laughs> Sweet. Of the groundhog? You heard it here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, I can guarantee that. But uh, the, the tryouts are on Wednesday from 6 to 9. Uh-huh. And Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. over at or- Oranger. Is it Oranger or Oranger? It's, I think it's Oranger. Oranger, okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's oranger than oh, wait, orange. Wait, is it Lejeune or Lejeune? It's kind of like tomato, tomato. Yeah. But, uh, potato, uh, potato. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's where it is. And if you go to our Facebook page, which is Honor, H-O-N-O-U-R, uh-huh. the musical, you'll get all the details of what we're asking you to do. And even if you just simply show up unprepared, we'll still listen to you. We don't care. Nice. Well, I we might, care. might come we'll up there and to pretend to do some stuff. So yeah. We've got three minutes to do live live music, by the way. You want to do it? You want to do it? Well, I would say that you... Go for it. I mean, <laughs> I'll play my fiddle at Fuller's music. <laughs> <laughs> well here. Anyway, so here is the dance music, uh, dance tune version of uh, Jefferson's campaign song, Jefferson and Liberty. I have never had a violin played in my studio before, ever. Wow. How okay. I can only imagine learning how to play like that. Like how long did it take you to actually get good at that? Uh well, I've been doing it for 52 years. 52. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> so your student your students have some big shoes to fill. Notice he didn't say he was good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pablo Casals, the cellist, was once asked why he still practiced when he's like, at that point, you know, Yo-Yo Ma was still just a kid, so so he, he, he was, you know, so Pablo Casals was the greatest cellist in the world, and someone asked him, well, Mr. Casals, why do you still practice? And his response was brilliant, because I feel like I'm getting somewhere. Yes. Well, I, do you ever read the book, The, Out, uh, the Outliers? They believe that you have to, it, there's a statement that you have to do 10,000 hours of any craft to be able to be a master of it. You have to put a minimum of 10,000 hours into learning it, practicing sure. it, and then you have to maintain it, right? Right, right. If yeah. you stop, if you stop, that muscle it. memory goes away, and you Absolutely. might think you know it, but you just won't have the, you won't have the touch for it anymore. See, that was in the Groundhog the Day, because that's, he, he did, took him 10,000 hours at each of those skills, learning how to play piano, learning how to get really good at Jeopardy, learning all of these things. So, right. uh, you can, uh, by logical extrapolation, say that he spent about 10,000 years in that loop living and Groundhog Day over and over again. 10,000 hours. Yeah, but right. he spent he learned all these different crafts. Yeah, so the combined 10,000 hours of each yeah. of those would add up to thousands of years. Or, or, or 10,000 hours in total, and you just spend an hour doing each thing. So that it would be 10, 20, what did he do, 30 different things? I have no idea. I'll have to watch it again. Bill Murray's great. <laughs> I'll bring the popcorn. So we all have to watch <laughs> nice. it Nice. Yeah. Anyway, uh, well, I've got to go teach violin, uh, but I'll. So how can people? How can people? Bill. How can people come and be a part of the class if they want to get? If they want to learn how to play violin, how can oh. I harass you for, for okay. tips on playing? Well, you can. I, I teach several different places. Uh, one of them is Fuller's Music House, and you can walk into Fuller's, get a list of, of teachers, and I'm on there. And in fact, I supervise the teaching studio for mm-hmm. uh, for Fuller's Music. I'm also teaching a class in ukulele this week. It already started yesterday, but maybe we'll do it again sometime at the New Bern Arts and Wellness Center, right at the intersection of Queen Street and Broad Street. And I've taught some other places, too. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So how can they get a hold of you? Just go to Fuller's? 
Uh, for for violin lessons, yeah, the be- uh, fiddle lessons or mm-hmm. individual ukulele lessons, yeah, Fuller's music, all your musical needs under one roof. Two five, <laughs> it's at twenty three ten Trent Road, two five two six three eight two eight one one. Right on. Uh, to contact me directly, I have a website www.musicalhistorian.com. Uh, they could go there. I think there's contact information there. I think it works. <laughs> I, just, I hope it works. Changing it, change, changing it Come out. see John Dro to get a violin bow. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. John John is the man. Yeah, man. Right on. Well, Simon, right. thank you, yeah. man, for coming thank in. You. I'll let you go get on your class because I want to. I want to get into this conversation about this this article in the County Compass and all this uh, other stuff. And I don't know if you can. Stage you want to put you want to put some music to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I remembered how to play strange strange fruit, the really <laughs> oh, oh man. man. I would play. <laughs> so, joining this conversation is Diane from the Pamico. I think it's the Pamico Progressives. I think it is Parker. Bring up six. Got it. Diane, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Good, Good morning. morning to you. You're at the table with Bill Han and myself. Hey Give everybody a little background. Who are you and what do you do? Hey, hey, Bill. Um, well, I work with Pamico Progressives, and we recently put on a rally. And uh, the rally was in protest of the County Compass article that was recently published in uh, the week of June 20th. Mm -hmm. In the article, um, there was a picture of a lynching noose, and uh, the, the words overlaid the picture, if we want to make America great again, we will have to make evil people fear punishment again. Mm -hmm. Well, the community was pretty outraged and uh, felt that their voices needed to be heard. So uh, we got a rally together. We had about 75 people attending. Uh, We had some really good speeches. And uh, one of the things that that, uh, struck me, really struck me, was that uh, one of the speakers brought pieces of paper. Uh, each paper was the name and the date of somebody who had been lynched. And at one point during the speeches, they read their names aloud. And it just was so striking that um, we all have to remember that lynching is a part of the local history and that people can't make light of it. People can't publish nooses and, and think that they can get away with it. It's just not okay. Okay. Now, I, I, I'm curious because I didn't hear... I heard about this after the fact. I saw the WITNR uh, coverage, and then I saw this article in the Sun Journal. Where did my Sun Journal go? <gasps> it's underneath it. Okay. I, I, so I saw the... I, when the articles all came out, and I saw the the, back, the the aftermath of all of this, I was curious to find out which community, who was it that was, was kind of driving all of this? Right. Well, I would say that's Pamlico County. Um, Pamlico Progressives are a group that um, that watches issues in the county and stands up for social justice and holds our politicians accountable and our news media as well. Mm -hmm. Um, The the County Compass is published in many counties. So we invited and publicized it in all the counties where the County Compass is published. Okay. Now, other than, like, what did you get out of it? The protest brings awareness to it. It brings people, you know, seeing that this was a thing. How did it turn out? Well, I think it was important that it brought the community together and gave them a voice to voice their concerns. The concerns were publicized on the major TV channels and in the Sun Journal. Thank you, Bill Hand. And um, uh, across the social media, in the, in the last month, for example, our uh, Facebook page has reached over 12,000 people, mostly based on this article. And I think raising the awareness and educating the public is a really important thing. Um, one of the things that was came out of the rally was the formation of a new group called Eastern North Carolina Against Hate. So E-N-C-A-H. And this group is going to um, consider further actions and also to monitor and respond to any future incidents of hate. 
And uh, I think it's a, going to be a valuable resource to, to let people know that we'll, we're watching. Mm -hmm. We will be watching for any further incidents of hate, and we will also be looking for progress in bipartisan reporting and allowing vo all of the voices in all of these counties to be heard, not just one-sided voices. Nice. Now, Bill, how did you get involved in all of this? You just saw it and wanted to write an article? Well, actually, the, how I got involved in it was the article came out. I had not even seen or heard about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't follow the county compass very closely, I'll have to admit. But uh, one of our editors brought it up to me and asked if I would be willing to look into the history of the noose mm -hmm. for a column. And at first I thought, well, we've been hanging people since the beginning of, of society. It's and in the Bible, people before, get hung all but, the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's like, what kind of a history can you write about that? But then I started looking into it, and there is a book called The Thirteenth Turn, which refers to the 13 loops that are in the noose, mm -hmm. that actually gives a history of it and its use in America. Mm -hmm. And I referred to that quite a bit in the column. And actually the hangman's noose as we know it is an American invention. Mm hmm uh, before that, everybody pretty much used a basic slip not to hang people mm -hmm. uh, through, throughout history. And actually, most of your lynchings were a basic slip not because the hangman's noose is one of the more difficult, slower knots to tie. Mm -hmm. but, um, and in, in his defense, I think the guy from the Pamlico paper did this as an act of ignorance that he allowed this picture to go in. Mm -hmm. I don't think he had any intention of saying, well, black people are evil and we need to hang them all. Mm -hmm. But he acted in some obvious ignorance, and it was, I don't understand how somebody would, would run that image and not mm -hmm. understand that there is definitely a racist past to it. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a conversation on Monday uh -huh. here at the table, and Diane, too, please do feel free to chime in here. We had a conversation yeah. on Monday about this has become, people are searching for reason to be upset. Yeah. Like, they're trying to find this. Yeah, we had yeah. a conversation over the weekend about mm -hmm. Ariel and the new Black Little Mermaid and everything else. And the idea popped up of, is this just what people are using to get a reaction? Is this what they're just using to get traction? Are they using this to market? Are they using this as advertising? Well, I don't know what the County Compass's readership is, but over the course of the last two weeks, everybody's talked about it. Everybody's picked it up. Everybody's gone to uh -huh. their website. Everybody's engaged with it. Well, I've, what little I've read of Ms. Hannah, I do not know Constance Hannah, who writes the Trump report card that this image appeared in. Yep. But she seems to shoot for, uh, in the imagery she uses, such as I was looking at the Trump report card for this week, and we've got a little Volkswagen with a giant clown head glued to it, and the title is, This is the Democratic Presidential Uber Candidate. Uber for Democratic Uber, yes. Democrat Candidates. So she's definitely going for jerking people's chains mm -hmm. and, and thinking it's funny. But I, I think its placement in there was very unfortunate and very wrong, but I don't think they put it in, or the publisher in particular, put it in with any intention of stirring up by the image itself. Right. I, but, I misunderstood yeah. that image when I saw it, and I admittedly didn't read the article. What I understood from that was that uh, we should hold an evil person like Donald Trump accountable and maybe hang him. And I'm all for that, uh, personally. I, I yeah, but here's my here's the thing, and this is the question I wanted to get to next, right? By censoring the county compass and their voice, aren't you doing the exact same thing you're expecting them to have done? If I were to tell you to shut up because you keep bringing up murdering the sitting president of the United States because you don't agree with him, that makes me the bigot and the bad guy because I don't agree with your perspective. Well, I don't think we should just murder him. I think there should definitely be a trial. <laughs> <laughs> That's my this is this is my point, right? If I tell you that your point of view is offensive to me and I don't want you to speak it anymore, I'm oppressive. But if this, in this particular case, yes, the image of a noose does purposely incite an emotional response, right? That's what she was going for. Nobody read the article. No one, right? I read the article. I oh, eventually went fans. through. Right? We, had yeah. to, we had to go back and find a copy of the article. Right. Diane yeah. sent it to me. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, for when I saw it, I didn't know if this lady was pro-Trump or anti-Trump because yeah. with the hate politics that we have today, that image could be used by either side. But, mm -hmm. Right. But so my question becomes, Diane, is the, is the goal to get them to stop using this type of anything? Are we trying to censor them? Are we trying, trying to tell these people because what we feel you are saying is wrong, you can't publish it anymore? Well, we believe in free speech, but we don't believe in hate speech. So the question is, does this uh, news, public, uh, published photo of the news, constitute hate speech? Um, we, are, we are also speaking to the County Compass advertisers and distributors 
to make them aware that this kind of thing is in their paper and by advertising with them they are supporting hate now he the publisher apologized publicly, publicly. for it. so is it st do you still hold to that case is it still going on even though he issued an apology and I, I, again, for me, it's a fact that I don't think he printed this as a hate piece himself. It is a, a hate image, but I don't think he presented it Parker. as that in his mind. Well, he probably isn't aware of, of what constitutes hate speech. I, there's no way that I don't believe he knew it was inappropriate or that it represented lynching. I just don't believe that. On the studio. And... He did apologize, but it was uh, about as minimal as you could get. And again, we're looking for an apology of action. If you're really sorry, let's see a change in what you're putting in your paper. And that's what we'll be watching for. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, okay, but again, and don't get me wrong, I get, I get the imagery. I get the, as a, as, a, as a black man in America, I see imagery that is representative of something, and I choose not to respond to certainly. I choose not to get emotional over it, and I get the feeling behind all of this. But by forcing him to change his paper, his audience, his advertisers, everybody in it have watched this paper circulate with Confederate paraphernalia in it, with, with talking about mer uh, memorabilia, talking about reenactment, talking all this other stuff. They are notably pro-Trump. That is their voice. That is what they do. That is their angle. And if you're picking up the county compass, you know that's what's going to be in there. By getting them to change that, by getting them to, to alter their path, aren't you impacting their freedom of speech? Because if they were to do it to you, you would want them to stop. Well, in right. We understand that they're a conservative paper and they're going to continue that stuff, but we draw the line at hate speech. So... And Patrick, you're wrong. The, the apology was on the front page. It wasn't actually embedded in an ad. Sorry, Diane. Patrick is in the comment section of the Duber Live Facebook page saying it that the was, apology it was It was super tiny, though. It was, but it, I mean, what did you expect them to do? Post a, a whole front page apology? And it was just an apology for the image. It wasn't an apology for the article or trying to censor anybody or anything like that. It was he just, didn't try well, and censor anybody yeah, because article. a third party, yeah. pub because a, a, a columnist published it, so he didn't censor her, right? He only had to apologize for the image because the image itself went with the article that said, we should really hold these three-letter government agencies accountable for what they did. They suck. We should do this let's hang them right i got it the imagery of the news ha is negative right i got that but if he's only apologizing for yeah this slipped through this was an image when he first saw it it didn't think oh i'm gonna put out here that i want to hang all black people this article is about hanging the agencies that did wrong and that's my stance so he apologized yeah. for not being sensitive enough to know this image was going to cause this issue yeah i like when i when i wrote the column the column itself was not on whether anyone has a right to present any particular image. Got and it. I agree that we we as a society have come to the point where we look to be insulted when we read. The first thing we do when we read is, how can I feel insulted by this? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, for me as a writer and as a, as a humorous writer on one of my columns and in general, it makes it very difficult because there is no sense of humor out there anymore. Everybody wants to be offended. And you mm -hmm. hear stand-up comedians saying, we've quit, we've quit performing at colleges because everybody is just offended at everything. Mm -hmm. um, my column pointed out, is the noose indeed a racist symbol? Because uh, on the Facebook page on WITN, a number of readers would come in and uh, responses were, oh, come on. People... It, it's just an execution method. It's not a symbol. Mm -hmm. And that's why I looked into it. Is there a definite racist connection to it? Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the research I did, it, it talks about how in many societies, European, American, early American, the hangman's noose, actually the hanging of a person, as horrible as it was, and hanging is not a quick death as a no. rule. Breaks um, your spine and then you suffocate. Well, but hopefully your neck snaps. Yeah, it, but no. It, it, hopefully, it, but it, as a rule, it does not. But that yeah. is the intention. But most often, that does not happen mm -hmm. because it's just difficult to get at that person. But all the people there having picnics on the lawn, they want to see you kick and yeah. gasp for air. That's why they're there. But societally, the idea was the person is hanged in public, and our hope is that we can convince this person to confess their sins and, and turn to God and go to an eternal reward rather than to eternal condemnation. Mm -hmm. And this person is hanged publicly, there's a lesson taught, and society is brought back 
to to sanity, to normalcy. It's, it's like watching a, a tragedy in, in Shakespeare or in honor of the play. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have your your tragic flaw. The character is overcome by the tragic flaw. He is destroyed, and yet normalcy returns at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything comes around. But when it came to the lynchings, they were drawn out. Uh, there were no benefit of clergy. Often torture was included. We had a man in New Bern, uh, the only case I could find of an actual lynching, but it took place at the old street, you used to go off Johnson, Johnson Street, the old bridge there. And they hung him out there. He had um, mm-hmm. he had broken into a grocery store, come into a grocery store, tried to rob it, apparently injured the woman who was at the, the counter with an axe. He mm-hmm. was arrested, mm-hmm. and immediately a lynch mob showed up and dragged him away from jail and hung him, and they shot him full of holes. Mm-hmm. And the idea of, of a hanging in this case is not we are trying to bring society back. We are trying to terrorize you, mm-hmm. and we want you people to know you are not real people, you are not good people, mm. and you are under our control, and you need to learn that. You're talking about in the book. In the in book. the book. It, mm-hmm. it talked about that whole concept, mm-hmm. and and that is what the, the noose comes to as a symbol now in America, mm-hmm. indelibly, from from uh, even from the Civil War forward, actually before the Civil War, but especially once the massive lynching started occurring after the Civil War, and that's why it is a racist symbol, because mm-hmm. it is a symbol that is used to terrorize one race or one people. Mm-hmm. That's why it is racist. And that's what the point of the column was. Uh, I'm not touching on issues of freedom of the press at all. I mean, if a guy wants to put that out. Okay. So know, there, there, there comes a point where, I mean, a hate speech to an, to an extent is illegal. I got it. but To an extent. What I'm worried about, and Diane, please chime in here. What I'm worried about is I've seen this happen already, right? Mm-hmm. Since Trump became president, I've seen a lot of people designate something as offensive, as hate speech, as not the way that they want it to change it. On both sides, yeah. And when that happens, it's a slippery slope. It's like, very slippery. We continue down the path of attacking people because they're wearing a shirt, because they're mm-hmm. waving a Confederate flag, because they have a different view, because they're wearing a MAGA hat. We keep doing that. Eventually, Trump's going to be out of office, and we're going to be stuck with the same policies, the same procedures, the same ideas yeah. of, you offended me, it's hate speech, let's remove it. And next thing you know, we're going to have everything removed from anything, and we're not going to be able to have a conversation or do anything without somebody calling that. Right. Uh, Charles, did you want me to try to call Jeff from uh, the county I council? Yeah, call. I got we, his have to, we have to make sure we understand the difference between offensive speech and images and T-shirts and hats and hate speech and mm-hmm. images and hats yep. so mm-hmm. i mean that's the Future challenge there's no there's no um fine, there's no big line in the sand it's something that has to be determined sometimes the courts have to determine it yep. sometimes other people besides us but i mean we all have an opinion if you don't like reading the com- county compass then you don't have to pick it up mm-hmm. so we know they're going to keep publishing. We know they're going to keep being conservative. We'd like them to be bipartisan, but it's a public, it's a privately owned business. Mm-hmm. We can't make them change. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the best, yep. the best ways to deal with this kind of a situation is to try to have conversations with people. But, Another thing that we've been thinking of is possibly doing more on racial reconciliation, having conversations between groups of citizens where they can actually discuss issues like this. Welcome to the table. That's the whole point. That's, yeah. the, that's the whole point of, of New Bern Live is to actually engage this conversation. And that's where I was going to ask next was I get bringing this to his attention. I get going after the compass, I get trying to get the correction, but now all you've created for all of the people who read this, right? Now you've created this void where it's, see, we can't say anything. We can't do anything. They're just going to go and fester and marinate in their own hatred and anger, and they're going to come back eventually. Well, you, you talk of that line, and that's what I wonder is, it's a line in the sand that can be moved either way in what direction, and if you don't have a standard, if you don't have an absolute, how can you honestly make that line? Be Because it becomes... So personal, such as for me, as I said, this guy made a mistake in putting this image in. As the editor, it's a as racist the of the image. Paper, yes. As a, the the columnist made the mistake of it, and uh, she's just she's an activist, and I won't talk about activists of anything. I mean, there, and I got the it. publisher let it in, 
But to me, he's now being told, you must be punished forever because you made a mistake that may well have been an honest mistake, that it was not a racist intent, but we're going to hold you to that no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that's where, okay, isn't education better than trying to make laws that you cannot speak that way? Uh, Alien and sedition law we talked about from the honor play. Mm -hmm. And it was a very tight reflection of today. The alien part was an act against French immigrants. Mm -hmm. And they were fearful there was going to be a French war. Thomas Jefferson was a big friend of a French, what an evil guy he is, and so on. So let's make it so if a Frenchman comes into America, he cannot vote, and he has to wait 16 years, eight or 16, I forget which, before he can even become a citizen. Mm -hmm. And this kind of parallels the immigration problem, Mm -hmm. what we have with Mexico and uh, the South American countries, the Central American countries. And then the sedition law was you could not print anything against the government. Mm -hmm. And a a publisher was arrested for writing critical comments about John Adams in that case. And that's another reflection we're looking now. People are coming up more and more with let's have hate speech laws. You can't speak against this. You can't speak against this. You can't create that law. You're not going to have a newspaper. But we've become such a political society that hate is going to be defined by the political party in power. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm conservative, you're liberal, my guy's in power, and you can no longer say anything that's against me, you get arrested for Mm -hmm. it. But then the next guy comes in and he's a I'm liberal, liberal. you're a conservative. My guy's in, you can't say anything if you do it, And all of a sudden what was fine for me to talk about suddenly will get me in jail. Mm -hmm. And what you had to talk about makes you a hero now. Mm -hmm. And that's where I fear that. That's where I see the slippery slope and the danger. I think it's better. This was racist. It's definitely a racist symbol. I don't know if a guy was being racist. I don't know a guy, period. Mm -hmm. He came out and apologized for it. Let's say, okay, like you said, what are you going to do now in the future? But should we be calling boycotts on advertisers and everybody else without giving him that chance to show, yeah, I'm going to come around and I will not do that again? Well, in my own personal history... I have two years' worth of history of writing to this editor and asking him to respond. Like, are those things fact that you're publishing? Are they paid opinions? Why aren't you writing that it's a paid opinion, that's a paid advertisement? Is that is that really fact that they're writing, or is it opinion? And he re- refuses to designate the things in his paper as fact or opinion. He refused... He's published a couple of my letters to the editor, maybe 20%, and just ignored the other 80%. I have tried talking to him, and as well as other people. I have sent him the um, journal, journalist's ethico, ethical code, and he didn't even respond to me in trying to get him to, to understand the difference between fact and opinion and what's ethical and not. And sure, talking is a great idea. And if it can help with racial reconciliation, that's fine. I'm not sure that just more talking with this editor is going to do the trick. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I understand what you're saying about laws against everything. And while talking is best, people that don't want to talk and don't want to listen sometimes need laws. In four states, there are, are laws against publishing pictures of the news. So... In other states, there are laws against hate speech, and it's defined as whatever it is then. So I hear your worry, and I agree with you that who knows who's making those laws, and and if it's the party in power. I mean, that's that's how we've gotten to this point already, right? The people in power made laws to go against their – to go to align with their feelings. Fast forward decades, centuries later, you run into these laws are stupid, and these laws were written from a perspective that is just ignorant. And I think with the opportunity with someone like the County Compass, one – He's an older gentleman, and eventually somebody younger with a different idea or different mindset is going to step into that role, and we're going to see a fundamental change in the way that thing operates, hopefully. And two, I think you have to continue to engage him. You have to continue to talk to him. You have to continue to be the change you expect to see out of him, even if it doesn't ever happen. Because the more you keep attacking, the more you keep chasing, the more he, like, he turns you off. Like the second he feels he's getting attacked, he's off. He's like, I'm not listening to you. And then he goes to his echo chamber, which is his audience. And his audience agrees with him. 
which now his po his position is reinforced. So, and Patrick's in the comment section. He says, I believe there's a point where you need to say something. What do you think that point is? Well, that point is when I have the individual who committed that act in front of me to be like, yo, man, why'd you do that? And full disclosure, I called Jeff Adelette office and his cell phone while we were on the air and got no answer from either yeah i called him i yep. called him yesterday mm -hmm. well i emailed him on sunday him and connie i called them uh called him no response and then i called him again this morning no response okay. and now we've called him a bunch so of times. we've given him Dude, every, Dude, every Dude, opportunity checked. to be yeah. a part of this conversation so it's not like we're just sequestered yep. in our own little thought bubble not talking to these people just about him no, so we, how far so how how long so what does he have to do what does the compass yep. have to do to redeem itself Part of my part of my concern also is we claim in our society today we claim there's no black and white everything yeah. is gray but we want to pass laws that are black and white. Yep. And okay, there are four states that say an image of a noose is illegal. What if I'm doing an old west movie, Hang 'em High, or one of these? Well, the noose in that case is an old west story. It's not racist. But if I take it's a picture part of, the of river. that western story. Can I, and that noose in the background of, of a couple guys or whatever is part of my poster image. Well, if I hang that poster up in that state, I'm going to get arrested for it. And it right. wasn't racist at all. It was part of the image of a Western theme. And that's where these black and white laws become a problem. It's like a lot of... Read, you'd have to read the full text of the law to see, you know, what yeah. the actual description of it was. I don't have that in front yeah. of me. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to say that there were people who did speak to the editor um, mm -hmm. after the image was published. And for for days, his response in, uh, in person and his response in writing was that it was free speech and there was nothing wrong with it. And he'd do it again if he had the opportunity. It wasn't until uh, Channel 7 was interviewing him mm -hmm. that he decided he should apologize. Mm. So, but, but the public I'm pressure as opposed to a law against it is what, what turned him. Now, there's, there's another aspect of something we should, really, we should really get into. We're past the point now where we have to wait for law enforcement. Right, we are past the point, and it's both a good thing and a terrifying thing. Right, the the world of social justice, the court of public opinion, is in full effect. We've seen people get offended by something, and businesses go out of business. We've seen people get offended by something, and people go to prison. Right, mm -hmm. creating a law that is now going to enforce our feelings about something on our grandchildren has a very quick way yeah. of backfiring on us. We can like, do you think he's going to change now, Diana? You think now that, that the court of public opinion has gone after him, has addressed it, has brought it out to light, do you think the compass is going to change? Um, I'm leaning towards no. It's not the answer that I'd like. I'd like it to be yes, but uh, time will tell. Okay. What, would be the, what do you think would be the most effective way to get to him? I guess pressure on the advertisers. Here's the one thing that I would like to see right off the bat. If he did this, I might have a different opinion. I would like him to label opinions in his paper as opinion, and I would like him to note if an ad is an ad including an opinion is paid for and who it's paid for by. Mm -hmm. Those things would go a, a long way towards uh, uh, ensuring that to the public, to the people who are concerned, that maybe he might change. Right. What do you yeah, think, Bill? I, I understand where if it's an advertisement, you should make sure that people are aware this is an advertisement. But journalistically speaking, as a journalist, if it's a column, it's opinion. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily fact. It's hopefully based on fact. But by definition, a column is opinion. It's an opinion piece. It appears on an opinion well, page or, or something on but it's opinion. Here is the paper with the with the uh, column. You see, it says news at the top. Mm -hmm. That's all it says on this page, news, and then it has the the CCTA page. Okay, my column on uh, on on the news, and I keep <coughs> thinking I've got to qualify. I'm, I mean, a rope, not a river. <laughs> yeah. um, was <clears throat> my conclusion? Racism. The flag is definitely racist, and and. End of discussion. The flag. The, the, the news is definitely racist. End of discussion. That's my opinion. Right. It appeared on the front page of the Sun Journal, and nowhere on there did it say there's an opinion piece at the bottom that is 
purely opinionated and, and not necessarily factual. It was right at the bottom of page one, and there was nothing like that. And I think that is a place where a newspaper can't t spend all of its time saying, the following is a column, and mm -hmm. for all I know, the lady's lying through her teeth. Mm -hmm. Or she, we don't agree with what she says. It's a column by definition. Well, maybe somewhere in the paper it should have some statement saying columns do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the Sun Journal, do not reflect the opinion of the county compass. That should be in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. The following there. is a paid program. But, yeah, but you can't. <laughs> I was going to yeah, say, we got to yeah, post it up in there. Yeah, every yeah, not yeah, I mean, those it, the staff and it may be in there. Like I said, I, don't, I tend not to read the county compass. I'm too busy writing for another newspaper. Um, now, okay, so last question, and then I'll let you guys both go because we're coming up on the end of this one. Diane, I'm, no I'm noticing a trend here, and I really, and, and I, I don't know how else to phrase this question, so I apologize. Who was, okay. the, who, were, who was the group of black people that brought this to your attention? Because it's been a trend in Eastern North Carolina. It's been a trend around the world, actually, that the first time I hear about a racial incident usually comes from a white person. Well, I have two things to say about that. One is this picture, this meme with these words, has mm -hmm. been popping up in cities all over the country. Mm -hmm. It's not just here. The other thing I have to say about it is that um, a white person brought it to my attention. Mm -hmm. She uh, took a picture of it and sent it to me. Okay. Now, as a black man in America, I've from my experience, have established that it is more effective for me to ignore ignorance and try and engage it from a perspective of, I don't know why you're doing that. I don't know who you are. I treat everybody like it's the first time I met them. If you have a problem with me, I want to understand what that problem is before I go to judging you or changing anything about that. I don't respond that way, and it has been my experience that that shuts a lot of these people down. A lot of the people who put out images like this, who put out information like that, who are purposely going out there to to get an emotional response from you based on race, based on gender, based on sexuality, if you just let them run and look, I don't really care what your opinion is in that particular case. I'm solid in where I am. I don't understand why you're doing that. I'm not getting angry about it. They lose the prize with what they were going after, yeah. and they stopped doing it. That's been my experience. And well, a b basic rule, if you get the, the, the guy who loses his temper first, loses, loses the battle, loses the argument. Mm -hmm. Whether mm -hmm. he's right or not, mm -hmm. he, bl he blew his top, and so everybody says, this guy was calm, he must be right. Mm -hmm. but well, I, can see, I can see circumstances where that approach would work, but like I said before, the people that spoke and wrote to him right after it happened... His wasn't any kind of response of maybe I made a mistake. His response was, "It's free speech, and I I would do it again." So I'm not sure that it worked work with everybody. I mean, they didn't get mad at him. They wrote they wrote and said, "You know, we've been friends for a long time. Why are you doing this? This is is uh, upsetting to me and a lot of people." And I don't know. No, just just the idea that um, you don't agree. I, I we violently disagree, yeah. and I've talked to you, and you're not willing to change your mind. So my only alternative is to shut you down, ignore no, you. No, that can't work. That can't work at all. I I fear to if that's where our politics are today. If we, you don't agree with me, then you're evil, and you need to be shut down. Right, but then it's then. Right, you're evil mm -hmm. and you need to be shut down. But then it's I'm going to go into my own echo chamber with all these people yeah. who are going to believe the same thing. But now if you're evil and like I said, you yep. came at me with I want to piss Charles off. I want to get that prize yep. of the guy who blows his top first. And I come at you and say, I'm not really angry. I'm not really affected by this. I don't understand why you did that. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you went this direction. And then you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. You know, I don't think they're going to keep attacking. I don't think they're going to keep going. And I think I think, yeah, he's got his group, his base, his his viewership, mm -hmm. his audience that are probably going to continue to support him, probably going to continue to drive him this way. So it's going to be a long time before you see anything change or you see yeah. anything drastically different. Well, and, and again with him, I see the image is definitely a racist image, but, but the copy beneath it, as radical conservative as you may think it is, is not racist. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so the, the two do not connect to each other. So we're not talking about a paper that is being blatantly, well... I mean, he does a lot of the uh, Confederate pride and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And 
that's a whole other issue, whether or not that is racist, depending on the outlooks or whatever. But the article does not reflect the picture per se as to its racist imagery. So that brings us to the, probably the final point of this. You used a picture that has absolutely nothing to do with its article. I get it. Yeah. You want to you want to draw drive the point home that these institutions, these agencies, yeah. should be destroyed or dealt with or punished. But whoever dragged down that meme should have turned their brain on before they put it in there. Yeah. Right on. Well, Bill, thank you, man, for coming in and giving your perspective in this article that's in the Sun Journal. You can guys get it today. I think it's yesterday's part, paper, but you can get it at New Bern Sun Journal, New Bern SJ dot com. com yeah. Go ahead, Diane. Um, thank you for having me on. Great if people to meet are you. interested in, and nice to meet you too. If people are interested in um, East Eastern North Carolina against hate, they could email me at e n c a h one. No, E N C A H two thousand nineteen at gmail dot com. Right. Thank on. you. Well, Diana, if you're ever downtown New Bern or if you ever want to come in or you want to bring any type of issues to the platform, please do reach out to us. I would love to have you back at any point. Great. Thanks so much. Right on, Diana. Bye bye. Well Thanks on my side. Right on, Bill. We've got Patrick in the comment section who says it's called sensationalism and many Facebook pages and news organizations use it daily, including New Bern Live, The Sun Journal, and WCTI. I would love to see where New Bern Live uses sensationalism, Patrick. I would really, really, really love to do that because my whole goal with this platform is to make sure that if you are triggered, you get both sides of the conversation with it all. So I would really love to see where we use sensationalism. But I do agree that a lot of organizations use that to be able to get the clicks, to be able to get the traffic, to be able to get the conversation going. And it worked. In Charles Pet Edwards is going to call me out. Going to call you if, out? If you ask him to do that, he's going to cite me. He's going to call me out. Oh, I'm, I, I mean... That's 100% what his, his motive is. It's the, it's yeah. the reason we do these things. Like, I'm totally yeah. fine with people calling me out. I'm totally fine with people getting engaged. Totally fine with people doing those things and, and having their opinion, having their perspective. But if you're going to do it, do it all the way. Yeah. If you're going to do it, be, be ready to come full circle on both sides of it to be able to say, look, I felt this way about it. I didn't feel this way about it. I felt you were doing this this way. I didn't. And then be ready for the challenge. And then don't freak out and don't lose your mind and don't lose your attitude. Don't get an attitude and don't pop off at me because I'm going to shut you off. Yeah. That's the end of that one. That's the end of that one. So, guys, I think... There we go. I don't. I don't think we have any additional comments. You got comments out there? Bill's back. <laughs> I think that's the end for this hour. We are seven minutes after the hour. We're gonna go out to the polling locations right here because today is the last day of the Republican primary. We're gonna find out which one of the two doctors are gonna well go up against. What's the guy? Alan Thomas. Yeah. Right. That's who won on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. Right. So Alan Thomas versus whichever our two doctors are going to be. I'm going to go over to the polls. And I think Parker and I and Lisa Lee from Colonial Capital Humane Society and probably Bill are going to just walk around and just go doctor, 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 doctor. 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 That's it, you guys, for Newborn Live. We're out of here. Remember, go show some love to the people that love us. Go say hi to Toyota of Newborn. Toyota of Newborn. Toyota. Go get, you some, Toyota, go get you some delicious coffee from Baker's Kitchen. Yes, I see you, Lisa, over here. She keeps trying to get me to it. She, she keeps forgetting I cannot and will not endorse a candidate ever. But Lisa Lee is walking around in a Dr. Greg Murphy t-shirt, and she wants you to know that. Which reminds me, tomorrow, everybody's going to meet Callie. The Newburn Live Pup of the Week. We need to find Ooh. a forever home. So we're out of here, guys. We will see you when we see you. Pup of the Week. Pup of the Week. Yeah.